Thank you very much. In fact, I've never used one of these, and I like to speak with my hands. So if I start waving, then it should warn me, because then probably you won't hear me anymore. Um, so thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me. Um, in fact, the organizers gave me a slightly daunting task of reviewing all of the modern cosmology in just an hour. And so that's almost impossible, I found, when I tried to prepare this. Um, so what I had to do is make a, a couple of very personal choices. Okay? And so I want to warn you from the beginning that the kind of things that I've selected aren't universally you know, the truth, or, well, I, I hope they're true, but uh, uh, I chose them with some kind of bias uh, as I still have. Okay, but we will see how it goes. So this is my plan. So what I want to do first is I want to give you a very broad outline of what I consider to be the central goals of early universe cosmology. So I like to call this the cosmological inverse problem. And that's basically a problem of how we relate observations that we make at late times and low energies uh, to more fundamental information about time energy behavior of the theory. Um, and I thought, so since most of you probably are interested in the weed, um, I think it's still useful to understand in a little bit of detail how we make that connection, just so that you see where the limitations are. Okay, what, what kind of things you can hope to learn from cosmological observations, um, and what, what you know what limits us. That's going to be rather broad in general, and so then I want to focus more specifically on two applications. Uh, in particular, I want to discuss the non-Gaussianity of the fluctuations and how that can teach us something. Um, and then finally, I want to say something about tensor modes and how tensor modes are sensitive to UV physics. And finally, I'm going to end with some very brief comments about future, future observations. Okay. So let me start uh, describing to you what the cosmological inverse problem is. So as I said, that's the problem of how we go from late-time observables, and those are mostly observables of the fluctuations in the constant microwave background, but also fluctuations of the large scale structure of the universe, and you know, all these fluctuations grow in time. And so the central challenge is how we take these observations that we make at late times and infer something about the cosmology of perturbations. Okay? So that's the first link we have to establish. Um, and then more ambitiously, we also like to explain where the cosmology of perturbations came from. So what their fundamental or ultraviolet uh, origin is. Okay? So very schematically, that's the central goal of, uh, of research. Um, but of course, you know, a lot of work, entire research areas, uh, are contained in kind of these errors. The decades of work, work literally trying to make these things precise. Thousands of papers trying to make these things precise. So I thought it would be useful to, to unpack this kind of picture a little bit. And so that's what I want to do first. So let me first explain a little bit how we make this link between observations we make at late times and the primordial origin of these fluctuations. Um, so as I already said, the key cosmological observable is the cosmic primary background. <coughs> that's the cleanest probe we have of fluctuations in the early universe. So the early universe was still very linear at the time when the CMD was formed, and that's why it's a very pristine picture of the, the fluctuations at that time. So about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, this afterglow of the Big Bang was formed. And so we see it today, and we see it uh, varying across the sky. And of course, you see here this beautiful image um, of a map of the sky and showing the temperature of the microwave background as a function of the position of the sky. Okay? So these are 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 variations uh, on top of a mean and a plaque body segment. We can take correlation functions of that map. So in particular, we can take a two point correlation function. That two-point correlation function that you see here is made up of about 10 to the 6 data points. And so it's rather remarkable that these 10 to the 6 data points are fitted by just six parameters. Okay. So this red curve here you know, varies according to cosmological parameters. There are six of them. Four of these parameters describe the composition and geometry of the universe. Two parameters describe the initial positions. But those six parameters are sufficient to fit these 10 to the 6 data points. Okay. So it's a highly constrained curve, and this curve, you know, didn't have to fit, but it seems you know, to be working with this degree of, of accuracy. Um, okay, so then the next step in the problem is to take these fluctuations that we observe at uh, recombination and trace them back in time. And here we want to trace them back to the beginning of the Hubble Bang. Okay. And so here by the beginning of the Hubble Bang, I simply mean a time that was sufficiently early that all of the modes of interest that we observe in the microfactor were outside of the horizon. Okay. And we know that once the modes were outside of the horizon, they were frozen and constant. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter when we pick this time as long as it was sufficiently early 
uh, during the something like phase. So at that time, you can identify perturbations in the curvature, space <laughs> curvature of the universe, these cur uh, curvature perturbations or co-moving curvature perturbations. We call them zeta as a function of position x. We can measure the two-point correlation function uh, of these curvature perturbations. And so what we find is that the power spectrum of two-point correlation function of zeta is very nearly scale invariant. Okay? So it has an amplitude that has been measured a long time ago in 1992 by Colby, uh, which is the same as 10 to the minus 5 squared. But importantly, it also has a slight deviation from scale invariance, which was discovered only recently. In fact, I should have also cited the W map, which was the first to really establish uh, a significant deviation from scale invariance. And then Planck now has made this very significant. So this is now a, I think, seven signal detection of a deviation from a perfectly scale invariant spectrum. So that's what these fluctuations look like at, at early times. We can also check for higher order correlations. And so the first deviation from a Gaussian uh, power spectrum would be the three point correlation function. And that's found to be small. So if you take an appropriate ratio of the three point correlation function of zeta divided by appropriate powers of the the power spectrum, get some dimension, some measure of the amount of non-Gaussianity in the fluctuations. And roughly speaking, we're going to discuss this in a little bit more detail later, but roughly speaking, the amount of non-Gaussianity is limited to be less, to be less than 0.1%. Okay? Um, and I'm going to qualify this a little bit because that's dependent on what type of shape this, this high spectrum has. Um, but for the basic scale invariant shapes of non-Gaussianity, this is the limit that we get. Uh, another important feature of these perturbations are that they span very large scales. So super horizon scales at the time when, when you measure them in the Hopping Dam. Uh, and they're correlated and coherent on these large scales. Okay? Um, so what that suggests is that these fluctuations weren't created causally during the Hopping Dam, but somehow there had to be a pre-phase before the Hopping Dam that generated these fluctuations. Okay? Um, and one way in which we infer this is by looking at the correlation between the polarization of the micro temperature, uh, and we find that it's coherent on very large scales, that coherence suggests that these fluctuations were created before the Hopping Dam. And so inflation, of course, is precisely such a mechanism that operated before the Hopping Dam, um, and it includes a very elegant mechanism using quantum mechanics to generate these observed correlations. And so here I'm defining inflation in, a ver in very general terms, purely kinematically, that for me inflation at this point it's just a phase in the early universe where color expansion, h of t, was nearly constant. Okay? Uh, and therefore, sources an expansion that is nearly exponential in time. Okay? That's a purely kinematic statement. The, the minimal assumption I have to make about the early universe in order to solve the horizon and flatness problems. Uh, but importantly, I didn't have to assume at this stage you know, what the precise mechanism of inflation was, whether there was a fundamental scale of your driving the expansion or something else. This is simply a kinematic statement about the expansion of the universe at that time. Um, so to analyze these fluctuations during inflation, it's first of all important to identify what the masses that we were during inflation. Okay. So let's first discuss what's the minimal set of masses degrees of freedom that we can have during inflation, and try to see if that minimal set of fluctuations is sufficient to explain these observed correlations. <laughs> so one massless degree of freedom during inflation, of course, is the graviton. And so we're going to talk about tensor model fluctuations uh, uh, later. Um, but there's a, there's a second massless degree of freedom that's uh, guaranteed to be there as soon as, say, the words nearly constant hover rate expansion. Okay? Um, and that's the degree of freedom associated with the local time shift, the time delay, or a time advancement of this inflationary history. Okay? So, so far, I've defined inflation in terms of a history h of t. Uh, I can now locally perturb that history by a function pi. Uh, um, and this function pi has various names. Okay? So I can call this, some people call this function pi the adiabatic moment. Uh, because if after inflation during the heating, I, I couple this field to the standard model degrees of freedom, it will generate so called adiabatic fluctuations. So these are fluctuations that don't distinguish between the different components. Uh, so there will be no fluctuations in the different compositions, in the composition of the universe. So the fluctuations in all of the species will be synchronized and all determined by the same degree of freedom pi. Uh, so to emphasize that sometimes this is called the idiomatic model. Some people call this the Boson-Boson of broken time translations. Okay. 
since you see that this mode is only generated because there's some time evolution during iteration. And so this is a breaking of the SIPA translation symmetry uh, that can be parameterized in terms of this uh, local memory freedom. And then colloquially, so colloquially sometimes this, this, this field is just called the clock uh, because it's a field that measures time for a local observer. So in a local patch, uh, different observer has a slightly different physical time, and that's parameterized by this observation pi. Okay. So what's nice about this field pi is that it's guaranteed, you know, by a generalization of Goldstone's theorem, it's guaranteed to be massless or very light during the equation. Uh, so in the simplest scenario, we can look at quantum fluctuations of this field pi, uh, and it turns out that these quantum fluctuations in the field pi are directly related to the field zeta that I introduced earlier, just by rescaling by the hollow rate. And during inflation, hover rate is nearly constant, so these are just literally proportional to each other. Uh, so if you wish, you can think of pi and zeta as being equivalent, for at least most of, most of the star. Okay. So this pi fluctuation directly sources zeta fluctuations. So we can ask the question, if you look at fluctuations in pi, will they get observed zeta correlations that look anything like what we've seen in the sun? Uh, of course, I wouldn't be telling the story if that wasn't the, <laughs> wasn't the case. Okay. Um, but the nice thing about this description is that it leads to a very model insensitive uh, description of the inflationary fluctuations. It's a guaranteed massive degree of freedom, and we can look at fluctuations generated for this massive degree of freedom. Um, and sometimes to emphasize the uniqueness of this kind of description, this is called the, the EFT of inflation. Uh, well, um, uh, but it's the unique degree of freedom that we, the first thing we should be looking at when we look for a source of fluctuations. Uh, so let me give a quick sketch of how we describe the effective action for this field pi. Okay. So starting off, there's a universal term, there's a kinetic term for this field pi. Okay. And this kinetic term is normalized by the rate of change of the expansion. So I told you this, this field pi only gets generated when there's some time evolution. Uh, so you see in the limit where I give a perfect super space, so H dot will be managed in that case, this becomes a non-dynamic field. And it's only the breaking of the super symmetry, which is characterized by the rate of change of the hollow rate that induces a dynamic field pi. Okay. So at, at, at lowest order, we just get some massless free field for pi. Um, and so here, most of you are probably more used to this language of writing things in terms of a fundamental scalar field, the slow roll inflation. It's very simple to, to go from just a simple slow roll action here, uh, expand the interval field in terms of this perturbed time coordinate. Uh, a leading order what you would get is simply a free massless field. Okay. Um, with a coefficient that sets by the rate of change of the field pi uh, okay. uh, So this leading term characterizes nothing but the leading dynamical behavior of the fluctuations in the interval. Um, but then can, there can be higher derivative corrections to the interval, and those higher derivative corrections are reflected by nonlinear corrections to this kinetic term for the field pi. Okay. And that's what I've shown here. Uh, so these are nonlinear corrections, but the, the fact that we expand it around the given inflationary history, uh, that symmetry uh, uh, constrains the type of terms that I can add here. So one thing you notice, for example, is that there's a relationship between a linear term and a quadratic term. So the symmetry is still nonlinearly realized, and that has some consequences for the size of the relations that we can generate in this framework. Um, so let's ask what these additional terms can do to my fluctuation, fluctuations. So first of all, because Lorentz invariance is broken, these fluctuations pi don't have to propagate at the speed of light. So there can be a non-trivial dispersion um, characterized by sound speed for the fluctuations. Um, and so that non-trivial dispersion has an effect on both the power spectrum and also on higher order fluctuations. Um, so here I've actually shown you what the predicted power spectrum would be uh, in, in this, this minimal case. Um, so it has this at the top here, so let me just go through what the structure of this prediction for the power spectrum. So it depends on the hover rate during inflation, depends on the rate of change of the hover rate, and on the sound speed of these fluctuations. Um, and so it's not so hard to understand the structure. Basically, any canonically normalized massive loop during a dissipate state phase has fluctuations that grow as h squared. This is not a canonically normalized field because of this normalization here. Uh, so I think of the canonically normalized field, I have to take account of this, this three factor. Um, this is also not yet the zeta fluctuation because pi and zeta were related by a factor of h. So there are two extra powers of h on the top. That's why I go into pi to zeta. 
And for small sound speeds, the fluctuations are in fact enhanced. And so the power spectrum for zeta fluctuations is here inversely of the sound speed. Okay. Um, so you can understand all of these factors, but the important point to note here is that this predicted power spectrum depends on a combination of three different parameters. So we have measured the size of this power spectrum, but that doesn't tell us anything individually about each of these parameters. It just tells us about this particular combination of H, H dot, and and sub C. Um, as I already mentioned, uh, the, this action here is constrained by symmetry. In particular, this is nonlinear realized symmetry that relates different powers in the perturbation expansion. So that means that a small sound speed, which affects the dispersion of the quadratic action, also relates higher order, affects higher order terms. So in particular, for small sound speed, I have a unique cubic, in cubic interaction that gets enhanced. Uh, so I can't make the sound speed small without generating nonlinear vertices and generate a certain number of non gaussianity So this non gaussianity parameter that I introduced earlier would fit inversely as a sound speed squared. And that means the fact that we haven't seen non gaussianity will limit the smallness of the sound speed of the And actually, I should have said that at this level, the leading order derivatives are in fact two independent cubic operators, one that is fixed purely in terms of the sound speed and the second one that has a second free coefficient, which I've labeled A here. Uh, so we can look at a two-dimensional exclusion plot, which puts observation constraints on the size of the sound speed and the size of the second coefficient A. Uh, these shaded regions here are the regions that are still allowed by the data. So of course, the slow roll inflation is still allowed, and some deviation from slow roll inflation is, is still allowed. Uh, but as soon as I make the sound speed too small, I would generate large amounts of the and so in, in particular, if I marginalize over this second parameter A, I get a lower bound on the sound speed, um, which is it, telling us that the sound speed has to be bigger than about 0.0. .0. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and we're going to see in a moment whether that's a weak or a strong constraint. Okay. That's some deviation from the kind of canonical slow roll picture that's still allowed, but it's limited to be uh, bigger than about 10 to minus 2. Okay, so that's the, fir the, the first uh, massive degree of freedom, uh, which sources sensitive fluctuations. The second massive degree of freedom is a graviton, which sources uh, tensor mode fluctuations. Um, the, the action for the graviton is even more constrained by symmetries, and so there's no, not so many things I can do to the, the action for the graviton. In particular, the kinetic term of the graviton is normalized just by the Planck, the Planck mass. And so therefore, the power spectrum of graviton fluctuations <coughs> It's almost canonically normalized, so it just scales with a homologate square with a rescaling given this by this Planck mass normalization. And that's why the power spectrum for tensor fluctuation is simply given by the ratio of the Hubble scale to the, the Planck mass. Okay? So if we were able to observe tensor mode fluctuations, it would immediately tell us you know, the size of the Hubble scale in the units of the, the Planck mass. Um, okay. Usually these observational constraints on the tensor power spectrum are expressed in terms of the tensor to scalar ratio, little r. Um, because we have measured the power spectrum for the scalars, we know this is a 10 to the minus 10 normalization. So we can get some, uh, we can take the ratio and express our constraints on the tensor component in terms of the tensor to scalar ratio. Uh, so here I've shown you updated constraints on this parameter r. So these are measurements that were released in last November, I believe. Uh, the Keck array and the bicep. Um, so this tensor scalar ratio R is now limited to be less than 7%. Okay, so that's the latest, the latest update on this important parameter. Uh, and we can see that this, 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 this is now re reaching interesting levels of parameter space where the simplest kind of things like m squared phi squared are definitively excluded uh, by these, these type of measurements. Okay? So you can see these contours here, contours in the R and S plane. The, the allowed contours here are these loop contours, and M star phi squared has a prediction that lies here, uh, which is safely outside of the region that's still. That's still. Um, okay, uh, so it's useful, I think, in order to get some more intuition for what the predictions are for uh, this fluctuation spectrum, to think about the, 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 the basic energy scales in the problem. Okay? I just want to do a quick exercise of going through the basic energy scales um, and seeing what we know about the basic energy scales here in inflation. 
as I already said, the fundamental energy scale that we have is the Hubble rate. Okay? This Hubble rate in some sense sets the energy scale of our experiment. Uh, so the fluctuations are frozen when they cross the horizon, which is when the frequency of a mode matches the Hubble rate. Uh, so since we typically trace these fluctuations back to the moment of horizon crossing, uh, when we make measurements in the CFD and we want to relate to the fluctuations, um, this is the energy scale that we are we're measuring when we do that, that transfer. Um, and as I said, we don't, we, we don't really know what this Hubble scale is yet. Uh, we have a lower bound because we haven't observed tensile mode fluctuations. So we know that the Hubble rate has to be a factor of 10 to the minus 4 times smaller than the Planck mass. Um, but we don't know whether it's much smaller than that or whether it's just around the corner and what the FGC is more. Um, a second fundamental scale is the <coughs> scale of symmetry breaking. Uh, so that's the rate of change of the inflation in the background. During slow, so roll inflation, this is simply given by the input on speed. Okay. Um, but more generally, if you don't want to commit yourself to a, a slow roll model, it's simply given by the rate of change of the Hubble rate, h dot. Okay. And so I, in order to keep things general, I'm going to call this scale of symmetry rate f pi. Um, so below the scale f pi, uh, it's useful to think of these fluctuations as also fluctuations. But above the scale f pi, I have to integrate in the background. And we will be able to guarantee to become relevant. And you notice that the scale h here is, is below the scale f pi. So at horizon crossing, it's very useful to think of these fluctuations as both slow modes. Uh, in particular, we actually know the hierarchy between h and f pi. Okay? This is a measured quantity. It turns out that the power spectrum of perturbative perturbations can be expressed precisely. Uh, and this is a very general relation, it doesn't seem so low or anything like that. Can be expressed precisely in terms of the ratio between h and f pi. So by having, by having measured the size of this, we actually know what this hierarchy is. And so this hierarchy is 50, 58. We know f pi has to be bigger than h. Uh, <coughs> So in the event that there are strong self interactions of this cold stone, there's an additional scale uh, that denotes the strong coupling of these fluctuations. So these fluctuations are guaranteed by the Gaussianity of the CMB to be weakly coupled at the horizon crossing. But as we extrapolate to higher energies, to higher frequencies, there might come a point where the theory becomes strongly coupled. So I call this point the scale lambda. And actually, at the moment, we don't know whether this scale lambda appears below or above the scale of temperature. In particular, we don't know whether the theory has to be recompleted before these new degrees of freedom associated with the background are guaranteed to play a important role or after that. Okay? Um, in fact, all that we know is that the non Gaussianity parameter itself is, is related to the ratio of h over lambda. Uh, that's constrained to be less than 10 to the minus 3. And so that then putting it on the one factor, so you can find that this scale lambda has to be given five times the whole but importantly, it's not yet bigger than 58, so it's not yet constrained to be the symmetry rate frequency. Um, so what I've told you so far is just the, the fundamental energy scales of inflation as described from the bottom up. So just the minimal amount of information that we have gained, uh, just by looking at the data and not trying to impose kind of any theoretical bias, or much theoretical bias on, on Try to explain these, these fluctuations. Um, but of course, ultimately, we, we hope to be able to embed this kind of framework into a more unique complete theory and try to answer questions of what actually generated inflation. Um, and we have a strong suspicion that when we do this, there will be additional energy scales that become relevant. So in string theory, in fact, we have a very good, uh, you know, we know what these scales mean. So there will be the string scale and the Kaluta Klein scale, maybe the scales of super partners uh, if, if the dynamics during inflation was some sort of symmetric origin. Um, and so we expect these, these scales to become relevant. In fact, we expect these scales to become relevant before the time scale. Okay. Uh, so especially in the string theory context, there will be additional UV scales that will enter the problem. And, and so it's interesting to ask, first of all, if we can see an inference of this, and how close these scales are relative to the Hubble scale of the time scale. Okay. Um, and what's exciting or interesting about inflation is the fact that it's very sensitive to these scales. Uh, so we usually have hard times to decouple all of these energy scales, and that's a blessing and a curse. It, it's, it's a curse because it makes it hard to control the inflation dynamics without having a complete understanding of all of these effects. Uh, but it's also a, a blessing in the sense that we can might be able to, to use inflation as a way of accepting these 
can see great freedom and learn something about these these here. These here, so we usually have uh, hard hard time access. Um, okay, so I just want to emphasize that, that there are actually two ways in which information is sensitive to higher scale physics. The first first way is for stainless, in the sense that the inflation in the background is sensitive to Planck's, Planck's exasperation. So we are sensitive to making assumptions or uh, corrections suppressed by the Planck scale, um, even for describing the inflation in the background dynamics. So when inflation occurs or not, or how long inflation lasts, uh, we'll be sensitive to operators that we can define at the Planck scale. Um, and that has been covered by many speakers uh, previous strength conferences. So in particular, I will these two talks. Uh, so I'm going to spend less time, in fact, on this uh, more famous UV sensitive sensitivity. And so instead, I want to, want to emphasize also the second aspect of UV sensitivity uh, that inflation of perturbations, so the perturbations that we observe, can be sensitive to massive particles, or these high scale degrees of freedom. Uh, and that also has become more uh, increasing in people have tried to study these things. Uh, so this is not as general as expressed UV sensitivity, but it has an added benefit that it's, it, it, it potentially leads to observable effects that are directly imprinted into our observables. And so we're so excited to still discuss this in a little bit more detail. Uh, and I should say that one of the first papers to analyze the phenomenology of the effects of massive particles on inflation perturbations was by Xing and Chen and Yi Wang. And Yi is here today, so you can ask him about this also. Uh, and then there were a lot of people who, who find the basic picture that we and Shin have, have introduced. Um, and also there were some talks about recent string fundamentals that, that describe this. And in fact, Nima gave a very nice set of Hazi lectures that I, I enjoyed. So you can also check this out there. Um, so what I will do in the rest of the talk is to describe two particular examples in how massive fields can impact cosmology. So I want to discuss the effects of massive fields High scale degrees of freedom on the number of sanity of the population and on tensor modes. And for the tensor modes, I'm going to dis be describing effects both on the power spectrum and more futuristically also on the tensor number of sanity. Okay, um, so let me start off describing number of sanity. Um, so, first of all, it's important to appreciate that there's an infinite number of ways, of course, in which the uh, a distribution can be non Gaussian, but only one way for a distribution to be Gaussian. Um, and so if it's Gaussian, everything is described in terms of the power spectrum. And so the description that I've given so far in terms of the power spectrum of CMD operations is complete. Okay. Um, and what's, what's, what's useful for this purpose, although there's an infinite number of, way, of ways in which the universe could be non-Gaussian, the data already suggests that it's not an arbitrary deviation from a Gaussian spectrum, but some small deviation from a Gaussian spectrum. And so we can describe the data to a good approximation as Gaussian with small perturbations. Okay? So that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, and so then the first diagnostic of non Gaussianity is to look for higher point correlation functions uh, that lead to small deviations from this Gaussian idea. And so the first diagnostic is a bispectrum, so a three point correlation function in, in real space. Uh, or in Fourier space, it's the correlation between three different Fourier momenta. Um, by the homogeneity of the universe, this, this correlation function is constrained to conserve momentum. So there's an overall momentum conserving delta function here. And then there's a shape of the slice spectrum that's given by this function. Okay. Um, so first of all, I've already introduced this earlier. The amplitude of the bias spectrum is defined in terms of this parameter, which is taking this bias spectrum shape function, evaluating it uh, in the equilateral configuration, where the three different wave numbers have equal size, and dividing it by appropriate powers of the power spectrum. Okay. That gives me a number that, that allows me to measure the size of the number of the energy. Um, so let's try to put this number into context. You know, what's a big and a small number for this value of F and L? Uh, so first of all, in my mind, so the theoretically interesting regime of number of the energy spans about seven orders of magnitude. Okay. So at the high end, when this parameter here becomes one, uh, uh, the theory becomes completely perturb not perturbative and non Gaussian. Okay? It's not a small deviation from a Gaussian spectrum anymore. So, we already know this is kind of what we, just from the fact that we looked at the sky and the first approximation is with Gaussian, we don't think we have to go into a regime where it's completely non perturbative and non Gaussian to start with. Uh, so, we, we, we cut off this parameter at this upper end here. Um, 
And then at this lower level, at the level of 10 to the minus 7, uh, we would generate non Gaussian energy just by gravitational evolution. So if you imagine you start off with a purely Gaussian spectrum, and then the spectrum evolves non linearly to the Einstein equations, for example, you would generate this amount of non Gaussian energy just by that evolution. Um, so in, in, in canonical slow roll inflation, for example, this is roughly speaking how the number of energy gets, gets generated at the level of what ends in minus seven. So below that level, you know, it, it's possible that we could tease out the small levels of non energy, but it becomes very challenging, and it would be polluted uh, for all kinds of nonlinear gravitational effects. Um, so it's more interesting to look for deviations that are stronger than gravitational, which would live in this this, this regime. Um, if we then look at the CMB data, it rules out the top three orders of magnitude in this range. Um, and with the qualifier that this depends on the shape of non energy. And there can be certain shapes of non energy, like the things that I think Igor's going to be talking about often, uh, that in fact are not constrained in this, in this type of parameterization as much. Okay. Um, but if the, the fluctuations are scale invariant, then maybe the, the higher conformation functions are scale invariant, then roughly speaking, this type of parameterization applies. Um, so we have ruled out three orders of magnitude, but we're leaving the window of opportunity, as I like to call it, is about four hours of magnitude. Okay? And so the type of effects that we'll, we'll be discussing are hoping to find signatures of heavy fields <coughs> within these four orders of magnitude uh, in this current Okay? Uh, that's, a, that's the amplitude of the number of energy, but a lot of information is, is contained, or arguably even more information is contained in the fact that this bispectrum has momentum dependence. Um, so we have three momenta, and we can we can vary these three momenta subject to a triangle inequality. So they have to form a closed triangle. So the special triangles, like an equilateral triangle or a very squeezed triangle, or triangle with flat edges, um, and then everything uh, you know in between those, those special possibilities. So I want to focus on two types of triangles. So this is, and we can classify the shape of non Gaussianity by the dominant signal. So whether the signal has dominant support for equilateral triangles or dominant support for squeeze triangles. Um, and I'd like to argue that the, the, the massive particles can have two types of effects, uh, which are uh, you know, sometimes called virtual effects. Uh, heavy particles that can be integrated up and lead to cells interactions, local cells interactions in the interphone field. Uh, that typically leads to signatures in this equilateral limit. And then real particles that are can produce on shell just by the expansion of the universe. Um, which leads to effects in this squeeze momentum configuration. And I'm mostly going to focus on this, um, but these type of constraints on the fluctuations of pi that I introduced earlier were in fact uh, constraints on the, the virtual effects. Uh, so just to make this distinction between virtual, virtual and, and the real a little bit more precise, so virtual particles are particles that are much heavier than the Hubble scale. So these can therefore be integrated out during inflation. They then lead to local interactions of the interval fluctuations. Uh, and these local interactions will be reflected in analytic scalings of this correlation function. In particular, analytic scalings as I go to soft momentum limits. Okay. I take the soft momentum limit of this, this vice spectrum, I go to the squeeze limit. Uh, I expect the correlation function to become analytic in the ratio of the soft and the hard momentum. And that's a signature of local interactions. Um, in contrast, real particles have masses that are close to the Hubble scale or below the Hubble scale. Uh, so they can't be fully integrated out, uh, but they can be produced due to the, just the expansion during inflation. Uh, in terms of the lower energy degrees of freedom, such as pi, they will be re reflected by non-local interactions. And those non-local interactions will show up as non-analytic scalings in the supplement. Uh, um, so for the rest of this part of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on this second separation, where there's a spectrum of particles with masses uh, not too much bigger than the Hubble scale, so that they can be accessed directly and produced on shell during inflation. Uh, and there are several possibilities for this type of separation that I've tried to you know, sketch here. So either you can have a set of masses that are, is, you know, that are very light, so they have masses much less than the, the Hubble scale, so these are the set of particles described here. And then we have another very light degree of freedom, which is the Goldstone mode. Um, and then these fields can interact with the Goldstone mode. Uh, this situation is very hard to make very make a 
generic predictions about this, okay? Because uh, now all of the fields are fluctuating wildly, and the curvature perturbation zeta is not just given by pi anymore, but it's given by the combination of all of those fields. Zeta itself is not necessarily frozen outside of the horizon. So it's hard to make a model independent prediction of the, the final statistics of zeta fluctuations in this type of thing. Okay? Although a lot of people have, have studied this, but for this for the reason that we can't make specific predictions, uh, I'd like to focus on the different situations. Uh, so there's a situation where the extra particles are not much lighter than the Hubble sphere, but you know, have masses right around the Hubble sphere. Um, and two rather natural situations where this could arise if, is if the underlying dynamic strain inflation was supersymmetric, except for the spontaneous gradient of supersymmetry due to the vacuum energy during inflation. So in flat space, this the theory might be supersymmetric, uh, but then when you put that theory into, uh, into an inflationary context, the inflationary vacuum energy will break uh, supersymmetry and that will induce masses to these extra fields uh, that, uh, that are, you know, what are the, the, the Hubble scale of slightly below that Hubble scale. So that's a rather natural way of generating fields that have masses clustered around the Hubble scale. Uh, another possibility would be if the fundamental origin of inflation was very stringy. Okay? If for some reason that we don't understand very well at the moment, uh, when we understand the, the, you know, the st strong curvature regime of, of string theory in an independent background better, uh, we might find that inflation is an inversion of consequence of this very complicated dynamics. Uh, um, so of course that's, that's hard to analyze and therefore there are not many examples of this. Um, but one would hope that uh, at the end of the day, when all of the dust settles, we could describe the phenomenology of such a scenario uh, by a weakly coupled theory of, of inflaton particles coupled uh, to degrees of freedom um, with masses according to string scale, uh, and maybe particles with spin corresponding to higher string excitations. Okay? Uh, and then one could use the Hubble expansion of the universe to generate excitations of these, these higher string points. Okay? Uh, that's, of course, like a dream scenario that. Uh, it would be nice to make more precise, and it would be nice if you know, some, of, some of you could give us some tools to, to, to really show that something like this can happen, uh, and that the origin of inflation really has some more fundamental stringy origin. But then the mechanism that I'm going to be describing here is going to allow you to, to then actually really test this, yeah? to try and excite these string models and uh, uh, look for their signatures. Um, OK, and that Eva, I'm not going to say much, too much about it, because Eva is going to be able to talk about this, I think. Uh, they have introduced uh, uh, an interesting scenario where the, these massive fields are coupled to the inflaton in such a way that they become sensitive not just to the Hubble scale as a source of generating particles, but even the time variation of the inflationary particles leads to the non-negative like particle production. And so that gives you access to massive particles with even slightly higher masses uh, than the inflation scale. Okay. And so if you were to describe it, Okay, but I want to describe how, how these types of scenarios work. Uh, so the idea is that uh, if, if a field has mass for the Hubble scale or less than the Hubble scale, you can spontaneously produce that field in the expanding space time. Since these fields are massive, they can decay into light fields, or they have to decay into light fields, because otherwise at late times they would be completely gone and diluted. So in order to observe the effects, they have to decay. They will decay into, for example, inflaton particles, um, and if this decay is a nonlinear process, you can generate uh, higher order correlations of the inflaton because they, orig and, and because they originated from a common source. Okay? So there are two particles that we spontaneously produce. Each of these particles decays, for example, into two or more inflaton particles. And so at the final region surface, you can have, then have higher order correlations of the inflaton. Um, so here, in fact, we have generated a, a four point correlation function. If I take one of the legs and evaluate it on the background inflaton and evaluate the remaining legs on the inflaton perturbation or this perturbation pi, I would generate a three point correlation function. So, this lowest order statistics that I introduced would be generated by such a process. Um, and as Nima and Kwan showed uh, last year, uh, this type of process leads to this characteristic non locality in cosmological correlators because this is generated by a decay of a massive particle different moments in time and different places in, in, in space. Uh, so let me give you a concrete example for this. Um, 
So this example is in two scalar fields. Uh, one of the fields has a mass that's a few times the normal scale. And there's a cross coupling between this massive field and the interpunct field. In this case, it's a dimension 5 operator, so that's got some scale lambda. Uh, I can try and integrate out this field because it's heavier than the Hubble scale. Uh, and so, in fact, the leading effect would come from this integrating out of the field. And of course, as usual, in integrating out massive fields, this will lead to an infinite series of local terms. Uh, that series can be, can be understood as an expansion in the energy scale of the experiment, H, divided by the mass of the particle, M. Okay? So in a series of local terms that lead to analytic scalings in the correlation function with amplitudes, amplitudes given by some power of H over M. Um, but in addition, we can have smaller effects that, that lead to non-local terms. So they're smaller, but they have some rare characteristic signature uh, with amplitudes that are proportion, proportional to some kind of Boltzmann suppression of the mass of the field to the, the power scale. Um, OK, so as I already said, this non-locality shows up as non elasticity in the squeeze momentum limit. The masses of these particles will lead to very distinctive oscillation in this uh, squeeze limit. Okay. So here I've shown you what the, the squeeze limit looks like. So I'm taking one of the momenta of the fields to be soft. So k long is a soft momentum, but I'm taking the zero to be much smaller than these two hard momenta. And that limits the, this correlation function will oscillate um, just because the massive field oscillates between these two times of particle decays. And so these oscillations of the massive field in time get, get imprinted into oscillations in momenta. Um, if the particles have spin, like we're envisioning in this kind of very stringy uh, um, parameterization of rigid particle classic higher spin particles, um, that leads to a unique angular signature in this correlation function. So if I take this squeeze limit with a hard momentum Ks and a soft momentum Kl, in a very the angle between the hard momentum, the hard momentum and the soft momentum. I expect the signal to vary in a characteristic way that depends on the, the Rhonda polynomial as a function of that angle um, with a degree that depends on the spin of the particle. Okay? So both the mass and the spin of the particle get imprinted in particular signatures of this soft momentum correlator. Um, so in principle, if we measure very accurately the soft momentum correlator, we could invert the problem and identify if there are additional particles present and measure their masses and measure their spin and so on. Uh, so okay, of, for, of course I should say something about the amplitude, this parameter f and l. So in, in general, this amplitude is very small. Okay? So in particular, if this mixing between the extra mass of scale and the interval is purely mediated by gravitational interactions, so that this mediated scale lambda is given by the Planck scale, uh, then there are two, two suppression factors, at least two suppression factors in this amplitude. There's first of all the, the slow parameter epsilon, which determines kind of the size of gravitational interactions during the inclusion. Uh, and then there's a Boltzmann suppression due to the fact that the heavier I make the particle, the harder it is to um, Okay? Uh, so this is, the, this is actually the size of our amplitude that we would be producing just by gravitation, this is gravitational floor that I introduced earlier, and then number seven, that's, that's this epsilon of uh, number seventy. And then this is further suppressed by, by the fact that mass of particles are hard to produce. Yeah. Uh, but that's of course under the very conservative assumption that the only the only force mediated between these two particles is, is gravity. Uh, uh, in principle, there could be additional forces between the time scale and the, the Hubble scale. If those forces are present, you can in principle boost the signal by at least a factor of ten to the seven. Um, so that's a possibility, and in particular, it's a possibility to discuss uh, what should you have um, There's also the possibility of having specific time dependent couplings to these particles. Uh, in, in, in that case, this Boltzmann suppression uh, gets reduced uh, to a suppression by a higher scale. And so, you know, something you're describing that leads also to a boost in hybrid signal, although the signal will be a little bit different. Um, if the masses are less than the Hubble scale, then there's in fact no Boltzmann suppression. Um, there's also then no oscillations in this field because the field is not, not massive enough to oscillate. But there's still a characteristic non analytic scaling in this field. Okay. Um, okay, so this is just to summarize. Uh, if we were able, able to observe this non analytic scaling in this field, we would and see their oscillating feature. This would measure the mass of the particle. We could see their angular dependence. Spin of the particle. Um, 
And so, you know, the hope is that by having stronger gravitational interactions mediating between those two particles, you could have uh, this show up in this window of opportunity. Uh, and future observations, just to show you what they what they look like. Future CMB basically has a hope of reducing these or improving these limits by one extra order of magnitude. Future large scale structure uh, with a lot of hard work. Uh, may be able to reduce this further by another order of magnitude. Uh, and then the final four orders of magnitude, people are starting to speculate whether using the topography of time and the operations um, can, can close this final, final part of this, this window. Um, but here, the forecasting really depends on the optimism or pessimism of the, the, the researcher. Okay. Uh, so I'm happy to discuss what goes into there. But in principle, at least, in terms of just the raw vote counting, uh, 21 centimeter can be able to close this um, Okay, so then in my final 10 minutes, I want to talk about pentamol fluctuations a little bit. Uh, here, I just want to emphasize that there are three theoretical targets for tensor So first of all, of course, there's, there's the amplitude of the tensor uh, And so this amplitude probes the UV, uh, of the UV sensitivity of the inflationary background. And that's a famous story that I won't repeat. Um, and then there, there are more, more subtle uh, and harder to observe effects on the scale dependence of the tensor fluctuation, and more futuristically, maybe even the non gaussianity of the tensor <coughs> And those two observables are sensitive to the, in exactly the same way that, or in a similar way to the other described for the scale fluctuations, uh, are sensitive to the UV through the effect of the inflation and fluctuation. Um, so in fact, in, in the view of time, I have some comments that are rather standard about how the tensor mode amplitude probes the UV, you know, through the, the, the famous sort of Planckian inspiration that it requires of an interval field. Um, and so I leave this in my slides. You can read this in, all, in your own time, but it's not, nothing very, uh, uh, yeah, the story has been told uh, in the time. So what I want to instead discuss is uh, uh, the question, if we were to observe tensor modes tomorrow, and I want to emphasize that we might literally observe this tomorrow, or people might already have observed this. Uh, in fact, maybe I, I'm going to have a slide showing you that there are about 20 or 30 experiments actively looking for tensor mode fluctuations right now. Uh, either one of these experiments uh, could, be, could see something. So the question I want to pose is if some, one of these experiments came out tomorrow and told us that tensor modes were present as a, at a rather large level, um, what can we learn? Or what, could, what additional physics could we throw? from these measurements. Uh, and so I'm going to discuss two rather futuristic examples. Uh, but again, they are examples that are of primary interest to string theorists. Um, so of course, one of the generic consequences of string theory that is that there are higher curvature corrections for Einstein gravity. Uh, these curvature corrections are organized by the string scale. And so just like before, if, if we had a scenario where the string scale was sufficiently low relative to the Hubble scale, we might hope that we would be able to see these these characteristic effects. Um, of course, this is, at, this is at the limit of control of an effective field theory. Um, so it's important that we're able to phrase predictions in this regime uh, uh, that, are, that are protected by symmetry principles. Okay? And so that, that, as was shown in these papers, uh, that's possible by, by appealing to a weakly broken conformal symmetry during the inflationary era uh, and using information of this underlying conformal symmetry to make predictions for the cosmological correlators that are insensitive to the details of kind of a Lagrangian formulation of this, this theory. Um, so I just want to highlight two effects. One effect that these higher corrections can have on the coupon correlation function. Uh, so the, the leading correction that you can have at the quadratic level of the action, action for tensors is that the einstein hilbert action can be corrected by a violet square term okay, with a coefficient that might be intraton dependent. Um, and the reason, the, the various ways of writing this correction, but the reason I've written in terms of the bias, bias tensor is because the bias tensor vanishes in a FW background. So it starts at linear order in, in fluctuations. Um, and so we, we would be able to put it into this form by using kind of the background equation of motions and using the definitions and so on. This is analyzed by one paper in 2008. Uh, the leading effect that this type of Correction has is that it changes the sound sweep for the tensor fluctuations, and it changes it in an inflaton dependent way. So as the inflaton evolves, 
the sound speed will evolve in time. <coughs> so the power spectrum for the tensile fluctuations will be also time dependent. Uh, and so this, this, this means that we inherit kind of a change to the scale dependence of the tensile fluctuation. And so that's what I've indicated here. The tilt of the tensile spectrum has a standard form in Einstein gravity, just given by the silver parameter epsilon. But in the presence of this higher curvature correction, you might get a change to this tilt of the spectrum. Uh, so if we are able to observe the tensile of spectrum, observe very carefully the tilt of the spectrum, and find it not to satisfy a consistent relation between the size of the tensors and their amplitude variation, uh, that might be an indication for some kind of correction to the action of this spectrum. Uh, the second possibility is that this violet tensor uh, leads to a correction to the cubic action. Okay? And in fact, uh, Malacina and Pimentel showed that in fact this correction is unique. The two parity conserving uh, corrections that one can have to the cubic Lagrangian. Um, so that also means that the, the three point vertex or the graviton three point function gets two unique contributions one that can be associated with Einstein gravity, one that can be associated with higher curvature correction. So if we were able to, to observe the, the, the three point correlation function uh, um, of, the, of, of this graviton and which was and, and found it not to correspond precisely to the Einstein gravity result. Well, this, this has to be an indication of this, this addition. Okay. Um, and that observing this effect would be very interesting because this vial cube correction has an argument to violate causality, that unless the theory of this vial cube term, term is embedded into a unique completion that contains a, an infinite power of that okay. And of course, we almost we, we take uh, an infinite power of weakly coupled mass of high spin particles. Almost as a definition of same um, Okay, so this is the slide, in fact, that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, these measurements of beam polarization of tensors are really only beginning. Uh, there's a large number, this is not even a complete list, a large number of experiments that are taking data right now. Uh, and we look forward to hearing the results <coughs> from all of them. Uh, at the moment, Bicep and Kettery are kind of a, an order of magnitude ahead of the rest of the, the field. Uh, but all of these, these other competing experiments are catching up, uh, and they're, they're, they're bound to reach that is the sensitivity that they're looking for for high energy fields. Um, okay, so then in my remaining few minutes, I just want to give you a quick, very quick outline uh, outlook for future observations. And I want to go back to this inverse problem that I, I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, so the measurements of CNV as anisotropies have provided very precise constraints on the spectrum of primordial fluctuations. Uh, so we have been very successful at taking CMB fluctuations and tracing back the origin to the beginning of the complex um, However, at present, you know, these initial conditions are described extremely well by just two numbers. Okay? So we just need an amplitude and a slight scale dependence for these fluctuations. And that seems to describe all of the data uh, uh, that we have at the moment. So it's very hard just from those two numbers to extract you know, more detailed <coughs> physics about the, the microscopic origin of inflation. And that's why I was describing you know, a couple of scenarios where you, uh, where you can look for deviations from this scaling power spectrum in the number of the energy or intensimals to tease out a little bit more information about what microscopic origin inflation has. Um, so this is just repeating this. Uh, in order to make progress, we really need theoretical predictions for deviations from these simple initial conditions. And so I've given two examples. Uh, but this, yeah, by no means will this example to me be representative or complete. Uh, in fact, it's, it's hoped that you know, future theorists or some of you will provide their own examples with their own motivations and the, their own observational signatures that we can look for. Um, and what makes all of this exciting is, is, is the fact that there will be so many data sets available in the future to you know, provide very stringent tests for any ideas that you might have. Thanks for a very nice review. 
I just wanted to point out one thing, which is even as you said, in a situation where, say, the Hubble scale is a lot of the string scale, or so we lack the tools at the moment to compute if there is such a viable scenario, the spectrum of motivation. But I just wanted to say that we can still use the approximate conformal invariance, etc., of the sitter space to actually put interesting constraints on the rough magnitude of the non Gaussianity. And using the kind of water identities and so on, uh, one can say that it's uh, constrained by the observed tilt as well as the overall magnitude of the two point function to be roughly in the range which we see it to be uh, today. Uh, so you can still say something's using symmetries even where you. Very good. Yeah, yeah. If, I, if I didn't have to rush at the end, I would emphasize it a bit more. But I do, I, I do emphasize to people that they should have a drop paper and go to bed with it. Let me make this point very clear. Uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, good question. So, uh, you discussed the constraint on the hierarchy of scales from the top down relative to the Hubble scale. Yeah. Uh, is there any constraint uh, on those top down scales relative to the scale of time translation symmetry breaking? Uh, you mean the UV scales now? Because I, I just. The only yes. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, yeah. I was just wondering if you have any comments on the attempts in the recent literature by St. Marshall and others to interpret the simplicity of the results in the data, still in terms of many, many fields, and sort of the central limit there of causing them to nonetheless converge on various <coughs> hour spectrum. There seems to be a debate in the literature about this. Do you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, there's a bit in literature, I think, because so what they're considering is you know many light fields with random interactions between those fields. And the idea the question is whether the immersion of power spectrum and the electro zeta fluctuations takes this very simple form, not because there's just one degree of freedom within the scalar uh, dynamics, uh, but because the selected dynamics are very complicated and emerging from in large hand to get this. Um, I think the tricky bit there is that the you're not guaranteed to hit an adiabatic attractor for the curvature perturbation. Um, so in principle, if you just randomly stick in many, many light fields with random interactions, the, the curvature perturbations will, will evolve outside of, outside of the horizon. Um, and so I have to trace, in fact, and then if, 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 if that non-adiabatic evolution is still present during the heating, I need to become sensitive to the details of the reading physics. Okay? So one has to, in those scenarios, in order to make predictions that I can trust Tracing them through reheating, I think you have to, you know, you have to funnel the fluctuations into a regime where only zeta survives and all of those heavy fields are more weak and massive uh, towards the end. Uh, I'm interested in the question whether it's possible to, to have emergent scale invariance from kind of large N behavior of many random fields. Uh, I just, so far, I've hit this non-adiabatic wall. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>